Giles Gauss, old man Gauss, got out of bed after eight hours of fitful tossing and intermittent nightmares and grouchily brewed coffee in the kitchen of his dilapidated farmhouse on the edge of Wharton Swamp. Half the night, it seemed, the stench of stale seawater had permeated the house. His interrupted sleep had been full of foreboding, full of shadowy and evil portents. Muttering to himself, he finished breakfast, took a milk pail from the pantry, and started for the barn where he kept his single cow. As he approached the barn, the strange offensive odor which had plagued him during the night assailed his nostrils anew. Wharton Swamp, that's what it is, he told himself, and he shook his fist at it. When he entered the barn, the stench was stronger than ever. Scowling, he strode toward the rickety stall where he kept the cow, Sari. Then he stood still and stared. Sari was gone. The stall was empty. He re-entered the barnyard. Sari! he called. Rushing back into the barn, he inspected the stall. The rancid reek of the sea was strong here, and now he noticed a kind of shine on the floor. Bending closer, he saw that it was a slick coat of glistening slime, as if some unspeakable creature covered with ooze had crept in and out of the stall. This discovery, coupled with the weird disappearance of Sari, was too much for his jangled nerves. With a wild yell, he ran out of the barn and started for Clinton Center, two miles away. His reception in the town enraged him. When he tried to tell people about the disappearance of his cow, Sari, about the reek of sea and ooze in his barn the night before, they laughed at him. The more impolite ones, that is. Most of the others patiently heard him out and then winked and touched their heads significantly when he was out of sight. One man, the druggist, Jim Jellinson, seemed mildly interested. He said that as he was coming through his backyard from the garage late the previous evening, he had heard a fearful shriek somewhere in the distant darkness. It might, he averred, have come from the direction of Wharton Swamp, but it had not been repeated, and eventually he had dismissed it from his mind. When old man Gauss started for home late in the afternoon, he was filled with sullen, resentful bitterness. They thought he was crazy, eh? Well, Sari was gone. They couldn't explain that away, could they? They explained the smell by saying it was dead fish cast up by the big wave which had washed into the swamp during the storm. Well, maybe. And the slime on his barn floor, they said, was snails. Snails! As if any he'd ever seen could cause that much slime. As he was nearing home, 
he met Rupert Barnaby, his nearest neighbor. Rupert was carrying a rifle, and he was accompanied by Jib, his hound. Although there had been an element of bad blood between the two bachelor neighbors for some time, old man Gauss, much to Barnaby's surprise, nodded and stopped. Evening hunt, neighbor? Barnaby nodded. Thought Jib might start up a coon. Moon later, likely. My cow's gone, old man Gauss said abruptly. If you should see her, he paused. But I don't think you will. Barnaby, bewildered, stared at him. What you getting at? Old man Gauss repeated what he had been telling all day in Clinton Center. He shook his head when he finished, adding, I wouldn't go hunting in that swamp tonight for $10,000. Rupert Barnaby threw back his head and laughed. He was a big man, muscular, resourceful, and level-headed, little given even to mild flights of the imagination. Gauss, he laughed, no use you giving me those spook stories. Your cow just got loose and wandered off. Why, I ain't even seen a bobcat in that swamp for over a year. Old man Gauss set his lips in a grim line. Maybe, he said as he turned away, you'll see something worse than a wild cat in that swamp tonight. Shaking his head, Barnaby took off after his impatient hound. Old man Gauss was getting queer, all right. One of these days, he would probably go off altogether and have to be locked up. Jib ran ahead, sniffing, darting from one ditch to another. As twilight closed in, Barnaby angled off the main road onto a twisting path which led into Wharton's swamp. He loved hunting. He would rather tramp through the bush than sit home in an easy chair. And even if an evening's foray, foray turned up nothing, he didn't particularly mind. Actually, he made out quite well. At least half his meat supply consisted of the rabbits, raccoons, and occasional deer, which he brought down in Wharton Swamp. When the moon rose, he was deep in the swamp. Twice, Jib started off after rabbits, but both times he returned quickly, looking somewhat sheepish. Something about his actions began to puzzle Barnaby. The dog seemed reluctant to move ahead. He hung directly in front of the hunter. Once, Barnaby tripped over him and nearly fell headlong. The hunter paused finally, frowning, and looked ahead. The swamp appeared no different than usual. True, a rather offensive stench hung over it, but that was merely the result of the big waves which had splashed far inland during the recent storm. Probably an accumulation of seaweed and the decaying bodies of some dead fish lay rotting in the stagnant pools of the swamp. Barnaby spoke sharply to the dog. What ails you, boy? Get now. You trip me again, you'll get a boot. The dog started ahead some distance, 
but with an air of reluctance. He sniffed the clumps of marsh grass in a perfunctory manner and seemed to have lost interest in the hunt. Barnaby grew exasperated. Even when they discovered the fresh track of a raccoon in the soft mud near a little pool, Jib manifested only slight interest. He did run on ahead a little further, however, and Barnaby began to hope that, as they closed in, he would regain his customary enthusiasm. In this he was mistaken. As they approached a thickly wooded area, latticed with, th latticed with tree thorns and covered with a heavy growth of cattails, the dog suddenly crouched in the shadows and refused to budge. Barnaby was sure that the raccoon had taken refuge in the nearby thickets. The dog's unheard of conduct infuriated him. After a number of sharp cuffs, Jip arose stiffly and moved ahead. The hair on his neck bristled up like a lion's mane. Swearing to himself, Barnaby pushed into the darkened thickets after him. It was quite black under the trees in spite of the moonlight and he moved cautiously in order to avoid stepping into a pool. Suddenly, with a frantic yelp of terror, Jip literally darted between his legs and shot out of the thickets. He ran on, howling weirdly as he went. For the first time that evening, Barnaby experienced a thrill of fear. In all his previous experience, Jib had never turned tail. On one occasion, he had even plunged in after a sizable bear. Scowling into the deep darkness, Barnaby could see nothing. There were, there were no baleful eyes glaring at him. As his own eyes tried to penetrate the surrounding darkness, he recalled Old Man Gauss's warning with a bitter grimace. If the old fool happened to spot Jib streaking out of the swamp, Barnaby would never hear the end of it. The thought of this angered him. He pushed ahead now with a feeling of sullen rage for whatever had terrified the dog. A good rifle shot would solve the mystery. All at once, he stopped and listened. From the darkness immediately ahead, he detected an odd sound, as if a large bulk were being dragged over the cattails. He hesitated, unable to see anything, stoutly resisting an idiotic impulse to flee. The black darkness and the slimy stench of stagnant pools here in the thickets seemed to be suffocating him. His heart began to pound as the slithering noise came closer. Every instinct told him to turn and run, but a kind of desperate stubbornness held him rooted to the spot. The sound grew louder, and suddenly he was positive that something deadly and formidable was rushing toward him through the thickets with accelerated speed. Throwing up his rifle, he pointed at the direction of the sound and fired. In the brief flash of the rifle, he saw something black and enormous and glistening, like a great flapping hood break through 
the final thicket. It seemed to be rolling toward him, and it was moving with nightmare swiftness. He wanted to scream and run, but even as the horror rushed forward, he understood that flight at this point would be futile. Even though the blood seemed to have congealed in his veins, he held the rifle pointed up and kept on firing. The shots had no visible effect. Sorry, the shots had no more visible effect than so many pebbles launched from a slingshot. At the last instant, his nerve broke and he tried to escape, but the monstrous hood lunged upon him, flapped over him, and squeezed. And his attempt at a scream turned into a tiny gurgle in his throat.